introduction stuff at the start. So, um, all right. All right. So hi, everyone. I'm Angela. Thanks for coming today. I hope you'll get a lot out of this. Um, so Clint skills is a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, it's about 20% of each of your exams. Although I have been told you're not doing the via anymore, which puts a different spin on things. Um, but that's still in addition to the OSCEs. And I'll get you guys onto the Kahoot first. So I'll, I've seen this done well in a couple of revision lectures that we had, which were last week for us. Um, so I'll flip between the Kahoot and the slides, um, just so we can get some questions in, in between. So that's the code up there. No overtly inappropriate names, please, because I have to stay accountable. Um, and the thing with this, what we'll cover in this lecture, keeping in mind the changes that have been made to this year's OSCEs for you guys. Previous year's lectures focused a lot on the how of physical examination. Today we'll be focusing more on what, because I think that's more relevant to what you guys have lined up for you. Um, and in addition to that, we've got all these other things, history, systems review, clinical presentations, and the salient findings of common test results and imaging. And of course, it wouldn't be a proper revision lecture without the buzzwords. So there's that. Um, oh, just a quick uh, kind of overview. I know lectures, especially Zoom lectures, can be tough. And I don't want you guys to feel under pressure or embarrassed. Uh, we get enough of that in hospital. So, uh, but I do hope you will be engaged. So my plan is um, we've got the Kahoot throughout so I can keep an eye on how you guys are going as well as some activities throughout. And you'll be able to tell, I might pause a bit. Um, and when I do that, you can spam my Zoom chat so I can see how you guys are going or at least say what you think the answer could be to yourself out loud, um, just to reinforce it for yourself. Uh, slides that you can copy in your own time, I'll flick through. And as I said, I've got a quiz and slides that will be available straight afterwards. Um, uh, but slides where there's things to understand, I'll spend a bit more time on. So I hope that sounds good. All right, jump right into it. So this is an approach to history and systems review that I started last year. I generally, we used to get pages physically and I'd fold it into eight or just scribble a you know, a few crosses. Um, and before I did this, I'd always be forgetting sections and important questions and, you know, get lost in the stress of the OSCE. This helps me stay on track and I tick them off as I go. And before I walk into the room, I prioritize the most important questions. Like if I see on the stem, it's short of shortness of breath, I'll just pop down smoking to make sure that I don't forget those high stake questions, um, which is something that you guys can uh, consider doing if it suits you. Uh, and also some good screening questions for all OSCE histories, fever, travel, um, change of weight, that's cow, um, and fatigue. So you can generally cover quite a bit of ground just with those four. All right, so first up we have RESP. Uh, this is the systems view for RESP. I bolded or highlighted important ones throughout, which you can take into account. Oh, and we've got a Kahoot. So I'll see if you guys are all on. Yeah, all right, we'll launch into it. I've turned the music off, so yeah. Think how many we have? Fourteen. So I'll, I'll put it out in case you don't understand my abbreviations. We've got a fifty-year-old male with drooping left upper eyelid, con contracted left pupil, dry skin, and he's slightly flushed on the left side of the face. What other sign is he likely to have? Yeah, it seems like. Um, oh, we've got some bit of a mix between C and D. So the thing with this one is it sounds a bit with the left upper eyelid, the drooping, the contracted left pupil. We've put it into plain speech, but what these are is the ptosis, meiosis, 
facial anhydrosis, the classic signs of Horner syndrome, um, and then the wasting of the hypo, which would occur with the pancreas tumor or some other causes as well, and the wasting of the hypothena muscles, that's part of the pancreas syndrome, um, which is also due to a pancreas tumor. So that's why those two are together. Um, that's why it's C. All right. Um, by Ceratops. Oh, I didn't even check the names, but I trust you guys. Simp. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So we've got a 30 year old female, six week history of loss of weight, hemoptysis, fever, apical consolidation on the chest x ray, and caseating granulomas on the biopsy. What? What is it? Yep. All right. So it looks like the majority of us said TB. Lung cancer, not a bad pick. Um, I can see pneumonia with the fever. So something with weight loss and hemoptysis. Yep. You always consider TB and a lung malignancy. In this case, the fever and apical consolidation, that's highly suggestive of TB. The caseating granulomas are specific to TB. So that's very characteristic. That's the final giveaway. Okay. Oh. Ooh, probably can't. <laughs> I hope it's not the real one. Okay. Um, what is the diagnosis? Oh, yeah, it's a lung function test. Can you guys see? Is there any way to make it bigger? I was worried about this. Is that, uh, okay. Hope the picture's big enough. Um, the FEV1 over FVC is 68. And there is a change. Yep, asthma. So um, with a restrictive, oh, with an obstructive pattern, you've got an FEV1. Um, oh, there we go. So FEV1 over FEC less than 70, and there was a change greater than 12% after the bronchodilator. Great. Ooh. Um, is this one also? Oh, we'll do this one first. Um, but with this chest x-ray here, what could it be? Okay, yep, it is COPD. Um, we'll go through chest x-rays in a bit. This was, I forgot the next question was chest x-ray, um, but the hyper-expanded lungs, so you can see they're quite massive, very big, flattened diagrams, narrow mediastinum, that's very characteristic of COPD. And we'll go through some more chest x-rays in a bit. Okay, flip back to the slideshow here. Oh, thanks Eddie for that spin. And all right, now I'll just go through some things which I think will be really helpful for your exams. So we've got some types of cough. Um, I think the main thing is uh, ACE inhibitor. Dry cough is the main side effect that might come up in lots of farm questions. And a wet cough is more likely to be lower origin because you've got all the gunk down there. With sputum, oh, with sputum, um, similar thing. So anything that's thick or yellow green, that means it's got, it's got a bit pus and infection in it going on. So infectious, clear or gray white, it's likely to be something else. So COPD asthma. And these ones are just my favorites because you see it and you immediately know what the answer is. So pink and frothy is pulmonary edema. Rusty is a real giveaway for streptococcal, streptococcus pneumoniae. And blood is generally, as I said before, malignancy or TB. Um, and oh, the previous question with the spirometry. Um, yep, yeah, so the asthma is a 12% change in the FEV1. Um, so yeah, that's something that caught me out as well when I was reviewing these questions myself. It's not the FEV1 over FEC, it's a 12% change in the FEV1 or 200 mils. Uh, this was a from a consultant this year. 
Um, so you can see there's a range of systems that could cause clubbing. Um, so can cardiovascular, GIT, respiratory. The main thing I think relevant to you, don't remember this all, I don't, um, is just for some reason it's important to know that it's not, COPD would not cause clubbing in itself if it progresses to lung cancer though, that's a different thing. Okay, now here's the part where you can uh, tell me what you think in the DMs. So with tracheal deviation, the most important one I think is tension pneumothorax. Is that directed towards or away the side with the pneumothorax? Yep, some very confident answers here. It is indeed, oh, I revealed it. It is indeed away from the side of the tension pneumothorax. Um, what about spontaneous pneumothorax? Oh, this dead girl's on fire. Um, yeah, exactly. There's no deviation at all. And that's how you can differentiate between the two. Um, other causes are like the retrosternogoita, lung cancer, lymphoma. That's got nothing to do with the pressure in the two sides. That's just because it's physically wonking it one way or the other. I find the whole pressure thing a bit confusing. Um, personally, what helps me pick on it uh, understand it a bit more or just remember it is it goes away from an expanded volume and towards if you've got volume loss um yeah helps me remember it a bit better okay now i'm going to go through this all so if we have hyper resonant percussion and decreased or absent breath sounds what kind of condition does that sound a lot like Yep, got lots of pneumothoraxes, that's right. So pneumothorax, um, you might've heard of a couple of different types. Uh, the spontaneous pneumothorax, which happens in your tall, healthy male. Um, I have seen it, the buzzword just being basketballer recently, so there's that. Um, that's due to subpleural boulet rupture. Um, the other causes is like air leakage or puncture, so you get your tension pneumothorax in say a motor vehicle accident when you've got penetrating chest wall injury and you get it, um, sometimes just get it in COPD as well because of the emphysema and the boule ruptures. It's a hyper resonant percussion because it's empty. Now it's the atelectasis, atelectasis, sorry, that happens if the bronchus is obstructed due to like a tumor mass or retained secretions and the air in that part of the lung supplied by the bronchus is absorbed and the affected part of the lung collapses. Um, I'm making, I'm talking about this because for me, I was always a bit confused. I thought both of them are lung collapses, but you see the pneumothorax, the percussion is hyper-resonant because it's empty. Um, in atelectasis, it's dull because it's actually that kind of deflated solid lung that you're hearing. But the breath sounds would still be decreased or absent. Um, plural effusion. Um, it's dull, I'll give you that. There's a specific buzzword they like to use. What type of dull is it? Stony, yep. So, um, and I kid you not, because I was touching up my Italian O'Connor making these slides and they literally say for consolidation, which is like pneumonia, um, dull, but not stony dull. So yeah, just remember stony dull is your fluid and dull is your solid. Uh, and as for the breath sounds here, I don't think it'd be hard to guess. So got bronchial breath sounds and the coarse crackles, which are due to the retained secretions. Um, next up, these are just some signs that I found confusing near two. So this vocal tactile fermentus, that's when you palpate the front or back of the chase, patient's chest, both hands at the same time. Um, and it's only abnormal if one side is different from the other. So very important to us before, you'd have people doing tactile fermentus with just one hand, um, and obviously they'd be able to tell you don't know what you're doing. Um, it's not too important as the clinical sign, it's because you can check it with vocal resonance as well. Uh, this is increased in confirming co consolidation. So normally it's muffled. You can listen to yourself with your own steps after this. Um, if, you're got, if you've got consolidation, um, the noise waves apple actually travel better and it becomes audible. I remember this because 
um, the, there's this thing called whispering, um, whispering, it's when even whispers are distinct. Oh, and with chest expansion, so the main thing is you hear, you see this often in question stems, and the main thing is that in unilateral conditions or conditions that are generally on one side only, it's only decreased over the effective side, affected side. Whereas if it's something that is more diffuse, it'll be symmetrical. Okay, here's some more time to chime in. So we'll do these fast. Tracheal tug, tripod position, purse lip breathing. Yeah, COPD. Okay, bibasal fine end inspiratory crepitations and clubbing. This might be a bit harder. It's uh, interstitial fibrosis. So these fine bibasal fine creps, you might have heard that a lot in heart failure. Yeah, it's generally due to either heart failure or interstitial lung disease. Uh, the asterixes is due to CO2 re retention, but you also see that in um, hepatic failure and re renal stuff as well. This we went before, we went through before, this is Horner's syndrome, the Pankos tumor. Um, and a young kid with a very productive cough and greasy stools, that's cystic fibrosis and the atopic, atopic triad is just that, eczema, asthma and hay fever. All right, I did see some questions before. Is there an underlying cause to finger clubbing? Um, I'm pretty sure there is, but I asked my consultant this as well and she said, like, we don't really know why in these different theories. I just accept it, to be honest. Um, but you could look into it if you're really curious. Um, oh, and these are things that you might get quizzed on. To be honest, I don't remember this anymore. Um, but yes. Oh, okay. So with chest x-rays, traditionally we get taught this whole spiel about how to discuss it. I've got to be honest with you, even when we did interpretations um, in our skis, usually it's just a question tacked on at the end. And I actually started going through, oh, I see the date and the patient's name. And my tutor just said, I, you don't have time for this. I don't care. What is it? So we're going to focus on interpretations and the salient findings. And we've got that in the cahoot. So flipping back to this, we had the COPD, remembering that was the flattened diaphragms and all that. Um, oh, Prof Leocano on final. And now I've got another one. All right. So is it A, pneumonia, B, pulmonary edema, C, cardiac failure, or D, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Phew, we all got in. I was worried we were not going to make it. Um, so this one I can see, yeah, this one I struggle with a bit as well. So I thought that's why I put it up here. Um, it's pulmonary edema because of this, what we, you can see there's kind of a pacifications spreading out like that. And that's this bat wing distribution of airspace of pacifications that you're supposed to see in pulmonary edema. In really bad ones, you'll see like it's just a whiteout. Um, there's also a sign called the stag atlas where you see upper low pulmonary diversion as well as increased uh, cardiothoracic, uh, oh, cardio silhouette here. But yeah, a challenging one, not really one I have a good, I had a good grasp on last year either. Um, yeah, I think if you're going to recognize a chest x-ray, you uh, go for COPD. Um, and what's this one? Same options as before. Yep, great. I thought if I put down low bar pneumonia, it'd be too much of a giveaway, uh, but you can see there's like a stripe here where it's consolidated here in the right middle lobe. OK, 
Okay. Um, I think that's it for the chest x-ray questions for now. Yep. Okay. So back to the slides. Um, oh, and we're on to CVS. Okay. Um, for um, cardiovascular for you guys, I think pretty much everyone uses paid cops um, in year two. I still use it in year three because some of the other ones, yeah, it's, you kind of graduate to cluster questions. But for cardiac especially, I found this really helpful. Um, FS is kind of optional because you should generally be asking about um, fatigue and systemics every time. Okay. Um, oh, with cardiac especially, there's some really giveaway descriptions with the pain. Um, I've listed them all here, or a lot of them here. Um, I might just ask a couple of quick questions. So angina, you've got the crushing and tightness. Um, what does it come on with? Exertion, yep. Yeah. And, and uh, with that, it's very predictable. So the patient will know how many steps or how far they walk before it comes on. And it's the same every time. And that's until you graduate to unstable angina, which is part of ACS. It's same, but worse. And it may radiate to, there's a few options you can choose here. Yep, I'm seeing a lot of arm, left arm, jaw, neck. These are all uh, shoulder. Yep, those are all good options. And the aortic dissection, that's tearing, because it's like tearing through the layers of the um, aorta. Um, have I got any others? Oh, pericarditis. That's characteristically relieved by sitting or leaning forward um, because that reduces the pressure on the parietal peritoneum. Oh, not pericardium. <laughs> okay. Um, and some real giveaways are pericarditis. You see these diffuse ST elevations on the SG ECG. Um, not to be missed because sometimes I, me personally, I get too fixated on trying to figure out which leads the AMI is in and I don't notice that they're actually everywhere. Uh, gourd, um, I mean, it's not necessarily gourd, but you always want to ask about eating, anything to do with eating, probably more GIT. And zoster, you get the burning, single, limited to a single dermatome. If you've got a rash, um, then you're pretty certain. Uh, these IE signs, they're just things to, um, things to know, so you can pick out the words and you'll know what it is. Oh, I thought I might go quickly through heart failure, just an overview. So you can get reduced ejection fraction, and that's to do with a filling defect, um, or preserved ejection fraction, which is, did I just say? Yeah, preserved ejection fraction, which is I think I mixed what I was saying up, sorry. Reduced ejection fraction is a pumping defect and preserved ejection fraction is a filling defect. More relevant to year two, I'd say, is the different signs and symptoms you get with both. So with the right, you've got the back pressure to the systemic circulation. So you've got fluid overloading there. You get things like ankle swelling, hepatomegaly and the raised JVP. The left, because it's going to the lungs, you get all the breathing ones. So dyspnea, orthopnea, PND. And of course, the most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure. So yeah, biventricular is a very common thing. And yeah. ECGs, if you want to go all in, like that whole chest x-ray overview we saw before, you can have a look at these notes. Um, otherwise, I will, we will just head on to the cahoot so you can pick out the most important patterns. Okay. Oh, the murmur of aortic stenosis is best heard at the sternal edge of the... Okay, so this is just something I just wanted you guys to know. Um, it's the second right ICS because that's the, it's the characteristic description of it is ejection systolic murmur 
um, best heard in the aortic area radiating to the, cor the, to the carotids and the aortic area is in the second right ICS. Um, the thing with inspiration and expiration, because I can see we got a bit of a um, mix between these two, the right-sided murmurs, so tricuspid um, and pulmonary, are accentuated by inspiration. So because that's you get increased venous return when you in, when you breathe in, and that increases your blood flow to the right side. That's why left-sided murmurs are accentuated by expiration instead. Hope that answers your question. Okay. Now on to the chest X of ECGs. Oh, right, so these are all ECGs now. What's the arrhythmia here? Oh yeah, nice and quick, I can see. It's a, yeah, it's a bit of a classic, this one. Yeah. Um, so I can see atrial flutter. Um, yeah, it's the classic sawtooth pattern. Um, and the way, the reason atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, they're a bit different. With flutter, the, there's a re-entrant circuit, and that is a repeated loop of atrial depolarization at 250 to 350 beats per minute. Whereas in atrial fibrillation, it's so fast. It's like the atrial rate is like 400 to 600 beats per minute. Um, and that's so fast that the P waves, like you don't have the absent P waves or you just see some really coarse fibrillatory waves instead. Also uh, atrial fibrillation, the, the classical description is absent P waves, irregularly irregular rhythm. Um, yeah, this one, I think the options are the same, but the picture's different. Yeah, so it's ventricular fibrillation this time. Sorry if I misled you by talking about atrial fibrillation before we went into this. Um, this is the most serious arrhythmia. You can get collapse, cardiac arrest, death. It's the ones that they shock most of the time in the TV shows. Um, so the ventricles are fibrillating and it's just bizarre. You're close to death. There's no ident identifiable P waves, QRS or T or anything. It's just chaotic. Um, ventricular tachycardia is more of a just a broad complex tachycardia. So fat QRSs. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, where's the AMI? So if you can't see, I'd say there's ST elevation in V1, V2, V3, and V4. Maybe a bit in V5. So anterior, um, that, well, the next question is also on this kind of thing to really lock it in. So leads one, AVL, V5 and V6, are they anterior, um, inferior? And if so, if, is that right coronary artery or left circumflex or are they lateral, which is left circumflex? Should I give it away? No, I don't think I did. Hope not. <laughs> ah, didn't, didn't mislead <laughs> too many of you. Um, so just to go over it quickly, inferior is right, to, uh, right coronary artery. That's two, three AVF. Anterior is left anterior descending. So V1 to four, which was the previous question. And lateral is the left circumflex. So wrapping around and it's V5, V6, because those are the ones on the very edge, as well as one AVL. Okay, I think that's it. Is that it for the ECG questions? Yep. Yeah. All right, to the slides. Okay. Oh, and these are three pictures that just really help me um, with ECGs. And the reason you can see V5 and V6 are all the way on the edge, as is one and AVL. That's why these are all the lateral leads. And th th this 3D picture is the one that really helps me. Okay. All right, on to GIT. Um, 
I found with GIT personally, it's when you're first learning all the systems reviews, it's really easy to forget ones for this one. So I've tried to organize it here top down, like starting from nausea and vomiting and going down to your heartburn, abdominal pain and going down um, to the more systemic stuff. Oh, I'm back to the Kahoot. <laughs> These reminders, because I'm going to forget otherwise. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, 45 year old female, um, increased body habitus, five hours history of right upper quadrant pain, fever, not jaundiced, and she's got a positive Murphy sign. So might take a bit of time to think about the differences between a couple of these. Oh, I couldn't fool any of you. All right. Oh, I was expecting some more mix. Um, but yeah, it's a cute collie. So if she had cholangitis, um, she'd probably be jaundiced as well. And if it was cholodocolithiasis, jaundice and no fever. Okay. Um, all right. All right. Okay. 76 year old male, seven kilograms loss of weight and loss of appetite over the last three months. And after he got admitted to hospital, he had sudden jaundice and no pain. Yes. So always beware painless jaundice, the whole loss of weight, loss of appetite over three months. That's some chronic kind of constitutional stuff going on there. Yeah, some more GIT questions. We've got 26 year old male, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, central addo pain, and he ate some mystery meat the night before. Oh, sorry. Oh, all right. No explanation needed. Oh, I think this is the last one for, oh, this is actually a renal question, guys. Um, so a patient with a spinal cord transection of around T10, which type of neurogenic bladder incontinence will they have? Bit of a challenging one. Um, and the Questions, you'll have them afterwards, so you can go through the answers a bit more slowly if you're confused. Yeah, okay. To be honest, I didn't really remember this until I was going through these questions either. Um, but a spastic um, reflex bladder, that involves unpredictable emptying caused by overactive bladder, bladder muscles that happens with injuries above T12, which was what happened in this case. The flaccid um, floppy bladder, that's non-reflex. That's just to do with you having underactive bladder muscles and it's an inability to empty. Um, and I got a question about the differences between the septal and anterior infarcts. Um, I've we get told that in Monash land, generally there's no such thing as septal, it's just all anterior V1 to V4. Um, if you want to be exact, um, septal is just saying that it's the, the wall between the two ventricles and I think that's V2, V3 in particular. But um, in general, we never really get asked about septal infarcts, it's more anterior, inferior, lateral, and maybe anterolateral if they're feeling fancy. Okay. Um, yep, so just localizing to the septal area. Okay, um, and with this one, it's a bit challenging picture, but see if you can pick out which one is the direct hernia. Is it A or B? Um, point out that the inguinal ligament is here. Yeah, and we're seeing an anatomical view. So when we palpate it, yeah. Um, B is the direct one because that's medial to the inguinal hernia. I remember it personally just by DIM, direct is medial. It was literally like the first question on our exam last year and 50 of us flunked it, uh, 50%. <laughs> um, I've got a bit of a summary here. So indirect is the incomplete closure of processus vaginalis, 
direct that's the weakness so usually an old man coughing that kind of thing okay with abdominal pain as with all pains um we want to do the wwqqaa thing um specific to this uh we ask i'll point out why we ask a couple of these uh just don't forget to ask about eating with gint uh and radiation there's a few characteristic ones like to the back is retroperitoneal, so something like your pancreas or any any aortic aneurysm, those are retroperitoneal structures. Uh, loin to groin, that's ureteric. Shoulder tip is diaphragmatic irritation due to subphrenic disease. And to the throat, you might get with esophageal stuff like reflux or spasm. Now, a colicky pain, that's one that comes and goes. That's muscular spasm in viscous walls, so your pipes. There's only so many pipes you have, so it's got to be your intestines, your ureters, or your bile ducts. And the whole thing with the sharp or dull pain, the dull, that's because it's visceral. So it's not, it's visceral, you not really well, not really localizing it. The sharp pain, that's say like with the appendicitis, when it becomes sharp, that's because it's gotten so bad that the inflammatory process is now involving the parietal peritoneum or it's reached there. Um, and as just an example, sitting forward and sitting up and leaning forward so that alleviates pancreatic pain in particular. Okay, so some really quick ones. Dull burning, burning epigastric pain relieved by antacids and or food. That is uh, peptic ulcer, ulcer disease. Now steady epigastric pain, range and back as I said, um, that's the pancreas. And colically, very severe loin to groin. That's a renal colic. Now, in terms of these abdominal signs, you don't really have to perform many more. So, I reckon for you guys, the most important thing is to be able to correlate which guy's name to which condition. So, I've grouped them together: Gray Turner's and Cullen's. That's to do with pancreatitis. McBurney's and Robsing's. That's to do with acute appendicitis. And this Murphy's. That's an inflamed gallbladder, as we said before, but didn't trick any of you guys. So, acute colic. <clears throat> Uh, I think I don't recall this being overly important. I'd say the main one is just B12 and macrocytic anemia. With this one, um, there's a couple of stories um, that you get. So fried rice, it's very characteristic of bacillus cereus. Um, traveler's diarrhea, it's generally E. coli. Someone that works in childcare or a child, they tend to get rotavirus. Rice water stools is your cholera and post-antibiotics at C. difficile. Okay, how to read it. Uh, the way with the systems review, this one you do kind of start branching into your cluster questions. The way I like to remember is it's, oh, the helpful note. It off, it, I like to think of it as pain, P and your prostate. Uh, the thing with these, I think the main thing is when I found when you're in the OSCE, it's a bit, don't be an idiot like me and just go, so do you have peas under? Like, it's not gonna go down well. So I thought I'd run through some quick ways to ask these questions to make the patient know what you're talking about as well. So urgency will be, oh, do you have a sudden compelling urge um, to urinate, a poorer stream of urine? Uh, do you need to go more frequently? Is there a delay when you go to urinate? Are you, do you find yourself unable to fully empty your bladder? Um, need to urinate soon again after urinating and get up in the middle of the night uh, to urinate. Up oh, and time for the cahoot. All right. So now we've got a 15 year old female with recurrent bouts of dysuria, increased frequency, some hematuria, What's the most likely step in management? This is mainly just to make sure that if you guys don't know already, you will know after this.
All right, it looks like Angela's cut out. So what we'll do is we'll wait to see if she jumps back on and then we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay, scary. And if we don't get through everything because of that, I'll send through some really comprehensive answers along with the quiz as well. Thanks, Angela. No worries. Um, okay. Oh. Yeah, so empirical trimethoprim, not sure if you guys caught that, but yeah, just remember that's first line for uncomplicated lower UTI. Oh, this one is, yeah, so we've got an STI and a UTI, and do you do a midstream or a first pass urine for each of those? Yep. Yeah. Oh, you guys did better than I expected. Um, so an STI, you have to think about what we're doing and what we want to see with both of these. An STI is first pass because we want to catch the infected um, cells of the, like the urethra and the cervix. Whereas the midstream one, we don't want those ones because that would just contaminate our sample with epithelial cells. We want the bugs um, in the ureters. Okay. Um, and now we've got a 50 year old man. Um, so drunk, alcohol, He's got edema, hyperglycemia on a background of hypertension and type two diabetes. He's got a high creatinine and lower GFR. Mainly he's got CKD. What is he most like, which of the signs is he most likely to have? Oh, okay. So yeah, this is where GIT and renal overlap a bit. The palmar erythema, um, that's something that you get in chronic liver disease. Whereas the puritis, you get that itching from uremia in CKD. When you've got too much urea in your blood, like the waste products, and they just make you itch. The Janeway lesions are IE. And I'm glad no one fell for the weakness of finger abduction because that was the pancreas tumor, which we've talked quite a bit about already. And last question before we head back is a 27 year old male who presents to the ED with frank hematuria, he's hypertensive, he had an ERTI two days ago. Is it polycystic kidney disease, nephrotic syndrome, a UTI and a background of an ERTI or a nephritic syndrome? Yeah, oh. As on top of this, so nephritic syndrome, yeah, hematuria, nephrotic would be um, proteinuria and plus or minus hematuria. Okay, now back to this. Uh, I think the most important thing to pick up is just what normal is and mainly because people like to ask you that in hospital in third year, <laughs> um, as well as frothy is a sign of proteinuria. As a side note, I've got that these are drugs that turn you up urine certain colors. You guys don't have to do your analysis anymore. I thought it'd still be useful to know when you see your exam questions. Some real giveaways are all the bold ones and I reckon these three are the ones that you just have to keep in mind. These like the bilirubin and stuff, you pro there'll probably be more to the story. Okay, endo. Um, this system of view is just really general. And you want to ask about changes and all these things. Um, yeah, to touch on one variety. The thing I found confusing is often like the only thing that you get in the exam question are these thyroid movement questions. So the first thing to check is if it moves on swelling. If it moves a bit, that's normal. But if it moves a lot, there's something wrong. So then you test whether or not um, it moves when they poke their tongue. Yes, and it's a thyroglossal cyst. No, and it's a goiter. Uh, and some buzzwords, which taking a look at time, um, I reckon it can probably fit those into all of them. Um, something I wanted to explore in further depth was something I found really confusing here too, the whole dexamethasone suppression test and all that. So, oh, whoop. Um, 
we've got Cushing syndrome itself, that is hypercortisolism. So um, just by definition, your cortisol level is up. Um, and the most common cause of all Cushing's is, you know, the exogenous too many steroids. Um, but if we want to work out which of the endogenous causes it is, the investigations to differentiate between those are the plasma ACTH and the DST. So first we work out if the problem's in the adrenals, yes, and the plasma ACTH is down because they're trying to get the adrenals to stop. That would be a primary adrenal cortical tumor, which is about 15 to 20% of all the endogenous causes. Um, no, if the plasma ACTH is raised, but then we have to figure out where that's coming from. So is that raised ACTH coming from the pituitary? Um, yes, and you have the high dose DST suppressed, which is Cushing's disease. So it could be like a pituitary adenoma, just something from the pituitary. But if not, then it's not suppressed and it's coming from somewhere else. Um, can't, can't see the chat at the moment. Um, so if there's any questions, I'll come to you at the end. Uh, with diabetes, I'd say people generally know the whole polydipsia, polyuria thing. I'd say the thing to keep in mind are the few different numbers. So it's 7-Eleven, like the shop, and HbA1c, one over 6.5. The way that I remember all the micro and macro is the micros are all the pathies and the macros are all the vasculars. Oh, I've got a diabetes history here because it was an OSCE station we got last year and kind of threw a lot of us off because um, it wasn't something that you really think to prepare. But if you have an idea of what it's going to be, then it's no problem at all. You just ask about the control um, their lifestyle risk factors, their medication, and just check whether they have all each of the micro and macrovascular complications. Um, a pituitary adenoma, the buzzword is bitemporal hemianopia um, because it's just pressing on the nerves, the optic chiasm, and I think a pr the prolactinoma is the most common. These are some signs to do with hyperparathyroidism in particular because of the hypocalcemia. So yeah, we've got the facial, the, the convulsions and the tetany that's giveaway signs for hypocalcemia. Okay, and um, oh, I think with this one, if you get it, just be nice. Um, be non-judgmental and understanding. Um, but there is a bit to do with phrasing and tax. So I'll just quickly run through some ways to ask these questions in a direct, but not indelicate way. So you can start off by saying something like how you identify and then exploring things like, have you ever been sexually active? Do you have sex with guys or girls or both? And then with the unprotected sex, it's a bit like smoking. So are you having, are you having unprotected or unprotected sex? Have you ever had unprotected sex? and what type they're on. Make sure to make sure if they say yes, you check. Um, and the rest, we've got periods, pregnancy, pain, and performance, if that's something that they raise. Oh, okay, we've got some poop. Um, so we've got a 14 year old male with sudden onset, severe crushing lower abdo pain, and the right testicle is red and swollen. Just in the interest of time, I might skip for this. Oh, no. All right. Yep. Oh, you guys are all on top of this. So, yeah, only testicular torsion would, would present with such bad pain and red and swollen testicle. Okay, now I've got a 26 year old female with a recent history of irregular periods, severe, dis severe period pain, and cyclical abdo pain. Her mother and grandmother had similar symptoms. Yeah. So, yeah, everyone got it. Endometriosis. Um, and that's it for the Reaper questions. Okay, he. 
I think the hardest with this one is just keeping in mind what can happen. So I've tried to split it up into you've got these things and you can either have too little or too much. And with heme in particular, I think it's quite useful to target or at least cluster your questions so you don't get lost yourself. So if you have got too little, um, yep, uh, won't, oh, well, I didn't actually know you could share the Kahoot. Um, I'll see if I can do that, but I have actually written all the questions down with some explanations. So you'll definitely have that. Um, all right, so yep, decreased red blood cells. These are the kinds of things you'd get, decreased platelets, um, just bleeding everywhere and decreased white blood cells, recurrent infections. Okay, um, and then with these in particular, there's some giveaway things like itching after a hot shower, that's polycythemia, um, ruba, hero. Anemia, I think this is quite confusing in year two, but basically, you know you've got anemia if you've got decreased red blood cells or hemoglobin. And then looking at the MCV is the next important thing. So to see if it's normal, micro or macro. And then with each, there's some investigations that give away most of the diagnoses. So with micro in particular, the iron studies will tell you if it's iron deficiency or anemia of chronic disease. So um, you get high transferrin or total iron binding capacity if it's iron deficiency because that's a uh, transferrin is like your increased propensity for binding to iron if you haven't got an, uh, enough iron there they're all like really trying to get all the iron they can whereas in anemia of chronic disease you're just stuffed thalassemia i thought i'd throw in here because target cells on peripheral smear i know you Last, when we were in uh, year two, we had this overwhelming hematology active learning where they just told us every single cell on the planet. Um, the one that I found has come in the most helpful is just knowing target cells of thalassemia. In terms of macrocytic anemia, you're looking for the presence of megalocytes and seg segmented neutrophils on the peripheral smear. If they're present, then you know it's megaloblastic. So vitamin B12 or folate deficiency, Drug induced, mainly those folate antagonists like methotrexate, and then non megalastic is stuff like alcohol. Oh, and I've got pictures here. So this is just your normie microcytic hypochromic anemia. That's a target cell. And these are your megaloblasts with your hypersensitive segmented neutrophil. All right. Neuro um, V wings versus pads is a good acronym for this. Um, and tingling, numbness, bowel or bladder incontinence, a good way to ask those things. Because um, I can see we only have three minutes left and I am gonna give you all the questions afterwards. Um, might just skip on the Kahoot for now. Um, so we've got Parkinson's disease and cerebellar disease. These are just the kind of giveaway descriptions and keeping in mind the whole, uh, I've forgotten what it's called now, the homunculus and everything and the arterial supply, so the brain lobes. Okay, this is something that I did want to go through um, in a bit more depth though. So sometimes again, like with the thyroid thing, the whole question, you just have to know this and you've got the answer. So with Rene, Rene's, um, it's when you put like the tuning fork on the mastoid process and then let, get them to let you know when the sound stops. And then also if they can hear it in front of them at the external meatus. What have I got here? Oh, uh, Rene's is actually unique in that a positive is the normal or like non-pathological uh, result and a negative is the one with something wrong with it. Okay, so with hearing loss, you do, the way I like to think about it is web is, you can tell if it's normal or there's something wrong if the sound lateralizes. Then if there's something abnormal, you do Rene's to work out what it is. If it's Rene's positive, then it's something to do with the neuro, the sensory neural. And if it's negative, that's to do with conduction. And then upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron, I just 
remember upper, everything goes up, hyper, hyper, upgoing plantars, and lower, everything goes down. Okay, um, quickly with the psych, we've got, um, this is probably how you should approach if you do get the MSE. Um, and I wish I had some better tip for this, but I literally just remembered abzam to before I walked into my OSCE and we actually did have it. I just wrote down all those letters in my very short term memory. Um, yeah. And if they make you do this, they should give it to you. Okay. Um, do I have anything else? Oh, all right. We've actually reached the end of the slides. So if you want to stay on for the rest of the Kahoot, you're welcome to. Otherwise, I know you do have another lecture, so um, you can head on to that. Um, but if you are going now, i just like to say that um, you've been really strong and brave this year and year two is hard enough as it is, um, but you've done so well, um, you've come so far, so just being here at this lecture means that you're on the right track to go, and that includes those of you that might be listening who are cramming this the night before. So <laughs> thanks for sticking it out. Um, any more questions, feel free to DM me on Facebook or just... Um, and if you're not already, we do have the year one to help page. So anything more general specific, we'll be able to help you on there. Otherwise, all the best if you're heading off. Um, bless you and thank you. Thanks, Angela. No worries. All right.